What does it mean to be found in Christ? Find out in today's service. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Today we'll hear two readings because I want to preach on this letter from Paul. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, beginning in chapter 3. Paul wrote, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, 
if somehow I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. And now the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared, wrong one, Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. I've added Paul's letter to the Philippians today because this is one of those rare and beautiful passages, you may even want to go back and hear it again, that give us the essence of the gospel. And today it's extra beautiful, if we can say such a thing, more beautiful than beautiful, because it's not a abstract philosophy of what it means to be saved by Christ, but it's Paul himself writing to us about his own experience of transformation. It's a, it's a personal letter from a person who has found himself wrong and then changed by Christ, who's explaining it, even as his explanation encourages us to do the same. Just beautiful. And to be honest, the gospel sometimes feels so complicated and complex with so many pieces and things to know and learn and believe and understand and that it can feel like too much, too much for a simple person. Or even so complicated that what you think you've discovered as maybe the essence of the faith surely couldn't be it because there must be so much more. And in fact, today, what we have Paul giving us 
is this sort of simple, beautiful explanation that is the whole thing. It really is the hinge that the whole beautiful door swings on. It's the fulcrum, it's the key, it's the core, and it's not complicated. It's, it's like many things where the simple thing has many complicated implications, right? Um, one simple truth, love, love, love one another, has a million consequences. What does it look like on the soccer field? What does it look like in world politics? What does it look like with your spouse? What does it look like with your children, with your boss? How can we do good business when we're loving our neighbor as ourselves? What does it mean the stock market? Let's see what I mean, complicated ramifications and implications and, um, and, uh, and examples of it in practice, but all coming from a very simple statement, a very simple teaching to understand. The gospel is like that. The gospel is that. A very simple, essential truth that has myriad, beautiful, and sometimes complicated implications. What is the essence that Paul is handing on to us today? Begin with fans in the stadium cheering for their team. Begin with soldiers on the front lines fighting. Begin with men marching in a women's rights rally. What do these things have in common? the fans in the stage, the soldiers, the men marching for women's rights. In each case, what we have is people who have taken on an affiliation that they have made a part of themselves and are willing to act for, okay? I'll say that again. In each case, we've got people who've taken on an affiliation, okay? They become a part of something bigger and because of that, they're willing to act on its behalf. So the fans in the, sta in the, in the, in the, in the um, stadium, they're not playing the game. Why do they care who wins? It doesn't matter to them, does it? They're not getting the bruises. They're not going to share in, the, um, in the, the, the trophy. Why do fans care? Why do we care? Why is it so easy to become fans? Because we have taken on the affiliation of that team. We've reached out spiritually from within ourselves and merged ourselves with that team so that what happens to them happens to us. And their success is our success. And their failure becomes our failure. It's a bizarre thing, but human beings do it all the time. And it's not bizarre bad, it's just, it's kind of a mystery if you stop and think about it. The way that we can take ourselves and like make ourselves bigger by taking on this larger thing and believing, truly believing, and therefore becoming a part of it. You see it also with the soldiers on the front line who are fighting. And why are they fighting maybe on foreign soil? They're fighting for a nation, the concept of nation. They're not, they didn't go to war because they themselves um, uh, are concerned about we need to make it more complicated, right? Someone from California goes to war in Iraq because there are people who are invading Iraq. Well, that has nothing to do with California, right? I mean, they didn't go because they, they cared so much about Iraq. They went because the nation said, this is important to us. This is of national interest, national security. We must go there as a nation to protect our nation. And the soldiers go because they feel so part of the nation that they're willing to fight that battle. And the, 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 the danger to the nation, they feel is a danger to them. And the success of the nation is a success for them. Even if, you know, it has something to do with uh, some foreign country that may not immediately affect the place where they're from. 
again, a, a man who's marching in a women's rights rally, and you can extrapolate this to all sorts of things, Women's, women marching for, you know, the rights of, of whomever. Um, why is the man marching for women's rights? Because he believes that women's rights matter, and so he's taken that cause onto himself and is marching in the parade and chanting with the people and demonstrating for the sake of those rights, even though as a man, they won't affect him, at least not directly. Perhaps through a spouse, perhaps through children, perhaps through the justice of the nation, but you see all of those are the same thing. The person seeing themselves in a bigger way and saying, if it affects my wife, it affects me because she and I are one, you see. If it affects my family, if it affects my daughters or my sons, again, they're different people. But if it affects them, it affects you because we've taken our spirit, we've opened ourself and wrapped others in it. And we do this in many ways. And it's bizarre and it's beautiful and it leads us to some of our most heroic and, and beautiful actions things we do on behalf of others in that third case in a march, things that we do to protect others, even if it might not immediately affect our safety with a soldier, the things we do to, to cheer and celebrate our fans and come out with nachos to watch the Super Bowl, even if it's towns we don't even live in. And maybe in the first quarter, you, you ask your children, who are we rooting for? I like the color red. We'll, we'll root for them. And for the next hour, you're rooting for that team. It's amazing and it's extraordinary and it's beautiful, but it's ex what it is more than anything is it's deeply human. This can also lead to some of our worst behaviors. And um, you might think about someone who wants to join a gang of some kind, and so they're willing to do whatever the initiation is. Uh, they're willing to get beat up in order to join this gang and become a part of this group. They're willing to steal or they're willing to hurt someone for the sake of this larger affiliation. People who go into battle on un for unjust reasons, but because they feel like, well, this is a part of who I am, and so we have to do it anyway, even if it's just to cause harm or to cause damage. People can be manipulated into believing these things. Things people, uh, we might believe that are just patently false and wrong, but because of our party, and I mean that in a little p way, because of, because of our group, if our group is in danger, if the leader of our group tells us something, then, then we believe it, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it might immediately cause us harm. The importance of being in that group, and not intellectual importance, but like the ontological importance, that's a theology word, it means being. Like, I am now a part of this group, and if you attack the group, you attack me. In order to defend the group, I will say things that aren't true, and I'll believe I'll, in my heart things that make no sense, or I'll do things that are against my own self-interest for the sake of this larger thing. I hope you're still with me. Remember on YouTube, you can click the gear and change the speed. <laughs> Put it on 1.25 or 1.5 and you'll get it even quicker. Um, but I really want to give you this today because this is really essential. It, it's essential to the gospel. St. Paul today is telling us that he was also wrapped up in all these things. He had all of these affiliations, and they were the most important thing to him at the time. It sounds a little bit, I mean, go back and read it, listen to it. It sounds a little bit like he still has some, some pride, and this is maybe why he ends the passage by saying, not that I've already attained it, it's hard to let go of these things. He still seems like he's pretty passionate about under the law, blameless. It was the last thing he said, right? It was the big one, under the law, blameless which means I followed every single one of the 600 and is it 13 or 23 different laws of Leviticus. Every single one I followed. I never violated a single one of them. But that's not it. It's not all. The fact that he was 
uh, uh, following the law or the fact that he was a Pharisee or that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Do you see what I, where it's starting to all click in? These are all of his different affiliations, all of the groups that he made himself a part of in his spirit circumcised on the eighth day of the, a member of the, of the people of Israel. And of course, these aren't only things that he himself found pride in and identity, but they're also things that his hearers may also have this held as their own of highest importance. What Paul goes on to say is that he's let all of those affiliations go. Now you say, well, wait, some of those were really good. The idea of, of being part of a family or being part of a, of, a, of a relationship or even being like part of a country, these feel like things that can lift us to our, our, highest, our highest good, our highest way of, of living and being and acting, heroic behaviors. But what he goes on to say is, all of these things I have let go and even regard them as rubbish. Why? Because of the surpassing value of being found and having Christ Jesus, my Lord. The righteousness that comes from God through faith. What Paul is saying is that he has, as much as humanly possible, tried to let go of all of those affiliations and instead claimed one, but not a small one, and not an insignificant one, but the great one, the greatest one, the one that stands above all and even encompasses all, and that is Christ. Paul is saying, I've let go of being an Israelite, and instead I've taken on being in Christ. I've let go of the righteousness that came from following the law, and instead I've received the righteousness that comes from Christ, which is my belief, my, my inner, like, this is like a belief that you're American, right? My belief that I'm a, 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 a fan of the, of the, of the, of the Thai, like, my belief, my affiliation, my inner sense of being a part of God through Christ. The righteousness that comes from knowing that I am in Christ and that this affiliation of being Christian brings into its arms everything else that is good. Because I'm in Christ, I'm a part of you. But you see, Let's, maybe we can go through each of these things. Because I'm in Christ, I cheer for the Detroit Lions, but I also have compassion for the other team. I can see the game that's going. I can cheer because that was a great tackle, even if it wasn't for my folks. And as, even if a part of me still like sort of wants the Lions to win, I can look and say, those guys played, the other team played a wonderful game. Does it take away from the joy, perhaps from a certain way, from a, uh, a, 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 um, a tribal way? My tribe didn't win, your tribe did win, but in a bigger way, you see sort of the beauty of the whole game. Some people in history have been known to have said, I am not a citizen of this country or that country, and I'm not telling you you can't do that, but listen to the words of Socrates. No, no, no less wise a person than Socrates himself who said, I am not an Athenian and I am not a Greek. I am a citizen of the world. Now, this could feel threatening and I don't want you to feel threatened. You don't have to let go being a part of the country that you love. You can love the country, but at the same time to love the world. Can I love my country and also love Canada? Can I love my country but also feel the pain of the people who are suffering in India? Not that they're not a part of me, but feel their pain because I feel like they're a part of me too, you see. 
It's not a letting go, it's a wider embrace. And I think St. Paul, Jesus, wouldn't even say, I'm a citizen of the world. What he would say is, I'm a citizen of the I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I'm a citizen of the earth. I'm a citizen of the universe. I'm a citizen of that which goes beyond this realm into the next. I'm a citizen of heaven and I'm a citizen of the cosmos. And I am a child of God. And so I'm not even cheering for the humans, but I'm caring about the chimpanzees, you see? Cause I, and, I'm, and I'm not just worrying about Earth, but I'm joyous that there could be life on Venus. Bigger, you see, pushing out the boundaries to be bigger, pushing them out on every side, to find that what it means to be found in Christ is, is, is universal life. It is it is unity with all humanity. As we say in the closing prayer, with, we've made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth to be made one with God through the Holy Spirit and, and to have faith that all these things are true, which is not a mental thing, but a belief, a belief that I am, a belief that I am a part of Christ and Christ a part of me. And I am a part of God and God a part of me. And that through God and through Christ, I am a citizen of, of all and everything and everywhere and always. The more we can hold this in our hearts, the more we can see why Paul might say, I regard these other things as rubbish, not because they weren't true, but because they were holding him back from a, a better way of being, a bigger way of being, a more alive and aware and awake and a love. I love that. I made it up, that word, years ago. I, maybe someone, a love, like alive but with love, alive in love, a love that I am here and I am there and in God I've been made eternal because I've been given eternal life in Christ. And all of this I gain the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, who is the one I serve, who is my Lord, who is the one I find myself to be a part of. And like a crystal through him, a part of all. Not that I've already attained this, Paul says, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has already made me his own. And so more and more, Paul's saying, I, he's saying, I stretch my heart to make it my own, forgetting what lies behind. I press on towards what lies ahead. The prize, he's making an image of a of a, of a race, forgetting you, the steps behind you in the race you don't care about. You're pressing on for the steps that are ahead, for the prize of the faith that comes of the call of God in Christ Jesus. That life, that wholeness, that external thing which when I make it a part of myself, makes me whole. That, that is the heart of what it means to be a Christ one, to be a Christian. You can be a Christian American who roots for the tigers and cares about your spouse and your children and marches for the rights of people who you care for. But it is a matter of degree to more and more find ourselves first Christian, first holy and whole in God, and then with arms wide open to embrace 
all these other groups and hold them together and bring them close to our heart. We continue with our prayers. With all our heart and all our mind, let us pray to the Lord Christ saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishop and yours, whoever it may be, for clergy and people, all the holy people of God, and indeed all people, and all. Let us pray to the Lord. For our president who is ill, for his wife and for his staff, for the leaders of the nations and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. For the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. In the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another in all our life to Christ our God, to thee, O Lord our God. Dear friends in Christ, the peace of Christ be always with you. We continue at the Lord's table. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Paul and Mary and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.